Thank you so much for joining us for LS Online. We're grateful that you're taking the time to stay caught up with the sermon series currently being taught at Living Stones Church in Elko, Nevada. Although we're honored to be able to provide this online content, we want to make clear that this is not to replace your personal involvement in a local church in any way. So please use this service when you need to, but make it a priority to get plugged into a local gospel preaching church where you can worship, serve, and give as soon as possible. God bless you. Now please enjoy. Good morning, Living Stones. It is good to see all you guys. It looks like the rain scared some people away or something. I don't know what happened, but uh, it's good to be here with y'all. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Garrett. I'm a pastor here at Living Stones, uh, and it's my honor uh, to welcome you guys today. If you're new to Living Stones, special welcome to you. We're glad that you would join us today. Uh, our hope today is just to worship Jesus uh, and to glorify him. We're not going to do anything outside of that. Uh, but one thing I want to remind you of it today as we worship is that we are celebrating Pentecost today. Uh, this is the day that commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon, uh, upon the apostles and other followers of Jesus while they were in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast uh, of Weeks, uh, as, as is described in the book of Acts. So as we worship our God today, what I want you all to keep in the forefront of your minds is gratitude for God giving us his spirit so long ago that we would never be alone. That is such good news. Uh, but before we get started this morning, I'm just going to pray for us uh, that his spirit would empower our worship today. So would you guys pray with me? God, we're so grateful that you have brought us here to worship you. But God, we need you. Without your spirit, uh, we can't even hope to worship you. So would you fill this, this room in our hearts uh, with your presence in a powerful way? God, would you give us joy as we lift our voices and our hands to worship you? God, would you open our hearts and minds to hear what you have for us today? God, we need you to show up, and we're grateful for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this morning we've been welcomed into the presence of God as we gather to worship. So let's take a minute to welcome one another into our presence and God's presence as well. So if you would stand, take a minute, shake somebody's hand, uh, meet somebody around you. Started again uh, here this morning. If you'd make your way back to your seats and remain standing, uh, church. T uh, this morning, our call to worship comes out of Hebrews chapter four, verse sixteen. It tells us, "Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need." This verse reminds us that our our uh, in our in our need, our in our need, we're supposed to, we, we are to turn to Christ. He is our salvation. He is where we find our grace, and he is where we get our mercy. Uh, we're going to sing a song that's going to reflect that truth. Uh, it is, uh, well, named, Lord, I Need You. So uh, go ahead and sing along with us as we uh, sing out to the Lord. Yeah. 
Yeah. 
church. Lord, thank you for everything you do for us, not only on a daily basis, but on a momentary basis. You are our salvation. You are our rock. You are the foundation that we can build our life on. Uh, Lord, as we go through your word, uh, help remind us and, and, and keep our hearts open and, and just give us the, the wisdom that you're going to try to give and f- to us today. Be with Pastor Nathan. Uh, open our hearts and our ears. We, we love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. So I've got an announcement for you. Uh, We call our announcements at Living Stones Next Levels because these are often ways where you can take your involvement at Living Stones or uh, your faith to the next level. So uh, what we got for you today is on June 20th. That's in about two weeks. uh, And it's a Monday night at 6 p.m. We are going to be hosting a night of worship here at Living Stones Church. We're really excited for this. Uh, We've started building a relationship with this husband-wife musician duo uh, that are going to come and lead us in worship. They are amazing. If you get a chance, feel free to check out their YouTube page. Um, They've got a lot of their stuff on there. Uh, They specialize in bringing the Psalms to life through song. Uh, And so our hope is that you will join us for that. It's free. Uh, You guys can come, you can worship, you can just come and listen, you can come and sit, whatever you want. But our hope is just to bless our own church and the community uh, at large with uh, a night of worship just that's a little bit out of the ordinary. So by all means, doors open at 530 on June 20th. Uh, Feel free to come in, uh, grab some coffee, hang out and uh, and worship with us. Now, as many of you know, uh, moving on. That was a quick transition. Moving on. As many of you know, Pastor Nathan and I were out for about two weeks last month. Uh, We got to go to Europe and do something pretty amazing. So we wanted to share some things with you about that. So I'm going to have him kick that off. uh, But if you guys wouldn't mind giving us your attention for a little bit longer. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that's been difficult in planning this week with Pastor Garrett is how in the world do we try to take 10 minutes to share all that we learned and experienced uh, over three days at this conference we were at. Um, As many of you you may know, and some of you might not know, we're part of a church planting network, global church planting network called Acts 29. And uh, this past two weeks ago, we were able to attend uh, the Acts 29 global gathering in Spain. And uh, what this is, is, is this. Every two years, our network holds a gathering like this where they bring in pastors and church planters and their teams and their wives, many of them, and they bring us all into one place uh, to worship God. Um, I can't even remember the exact numbers, but I believe there was something like over 20 languages in the room. Uh, I think over 40 countries were in the same room. And all of us were just worshiping Christ and hearing teaching from the word. Uh, And it was just a beautiful, beautiful time. But um, one of the things that we learned uh, that we wanted to share with you was the need that's over in Europe, the gospel need. Um, This year's conference was called, as you can see, Help for the Journey. And uh, we spent time in the book of Romans looking at how the gospel speaks to seasons of hardship in ministry and how we can find strength in Christ. And when we got to the conference, we walked into the first session, and uh, we learned kind of very quickly uh, the the dire state of of the gospel and Christianity in Europe. Uh, It was shared with us uh, this. Statistically speaking, uh, it is now possible to be born in Europe, to live a full life, and to die without ever meeting another Christian or hearing the gospel. Think about that. Like that's actually possible now. So as you can imagine, we were sitting there much like you guys were, we had the same reaction. We said, wow, what do you you mean? And as the conference went on, we were shocked by the needs of those men who are planting churches and their families and their teams and and, and the the struggles that they're going through in in really what is an altogether post-Christian culture in Europe. And uh, we were shocked at the spiritual state of of many of the European countries, um, but also at the very same time, in the struggle and in the need, we were encouraged by what God is doing through others as they labor to plant churches and preach the gospel in Europe. Especially, uh, we were encouraged by those that we're actually able to support 
as living stones here in Elko. And so for sake of time, we did meet a lot of people, but we're just going to share with you guys uh, three people that we met who we've been in relationship with and uh, share with you how you can pray, what their needs are, and a little bit about their story. So for the first one, I'll turn it back over to Pastor Garrett. So behind me, uh, you can see this photograph, and that is a couple of pastors who you know. It's Pastor Nathan and myself. Uh, it's also Pastor Mark South from the Sparks Church and uh, Pastor Greg from the Sparks Church. He looks happy in this picture. Just wait till later. Um, he has the best photo face of anyone. And right in the middle here, uh, of utmost importance, though, is J.D. Gilmore, who is a church planner in Italy that we've supported for a little over two years, so a little bit before the shutdowns and everything. Uh, we got to, to uh, meet him via Zoom or whatever, and uh, we started supporting his church. Now, um, we've supported that for two years, and getting to actually go there and see what in the world is going on was a huge blessing. Right. Um, JD's position as a church planner is kind of unique. Uh, for one, the area where he's planting uh, his church, it's, it's just not fertile ground. It's in Sicily, Italy. The Roman Catholic Church has the most influence as far as faith is concerned, uh, and that kind of makes it difficult for a Protestant church to take hold. They kind of look at us like uh, a cult or something. They're kind of like weirded out about what we're doing there. Uh, but um, for those outside of the Catholic Church as well, um, many have never heard the gospel and they often refuse to hear about it entirely. Um, they're very opposed to that, to this idea. They don't look at us favorably. They don't have the same kind of influence in their city um, as maybe American churches do. Um, Christianity is just not seen as a blessing uh, in Europe overall, and especially in Italy. But um, uh, the, the, the next thing that there's kind of an issue with, goodness, I'm tripping over my words. The second issue that JD has, how about that, uh, is that he is actually in need of more help. His wife has chronic fatigue. Right. Uh, so he's over here trying to plant a church uh, and regularly has to take breaks to um, take good, good care of his wife, uh, to make sure that his ministry remains his family first and foremost. Uh, and so that kind of just makes it difficult to do what he he's doing. His wife needs regular rest and recuperation. Um, and so what they've asked for, what the big thing that they've asked for, they've thanked us for our financial support, but they want to see more and more encouragement and on the ground uh, help. Right. In fact, they actually asked us to let our church know that if, if uh, we knew of a like retirement age couple who was looking to go out and do something kind of crazy uh, and missionary-like, they're looking for somebody to come alongside them and partner with them so that they can help begin to build that the stability of their church right. uh, as their situation is so kind of like unique uh, and, and in the shape that it's in. And so, hey, that, that's a, I'm literally asking all y'all, if you find yourself in that position, a retirement age person who thinks that they could maybe spend a year or two in another country just blessing and being a help to a church over there, there is a need for that. Now, JD is uh, simultaneously kind of pioneering new ways uh, for the churches stateside and the churches in Europe to bless one another. Right. He really sees a, a, a future of actually ascending mission, like our own groups from our church to go over there and be a part of what they're doing. And they would love to be able to do the same in hopes of getting getting training, encouragement, and support from our church as well. So JD is kind of, uh, he's kind of like putting these plans together and looking at options, not just for Italy, but for all of Europe that'll affect that. So such a cool thing to be able to hear. I want to thank each one of you uh, for supporting us as we got to go over and do this. Meeting JD was amazing. Meeting him in person was awesome. Hearing uh, the needs of his church, the needs of his family um, was eye-opening. And uh, my hope and my ask for all of you is just that you will continue to pray for yeah. him, that you'll continue to pray for church planning efforts in Italy, uh, and that for those of you who are in that position in life, maybe that you would consider going overseas and helping to spread the gospel, helping to create stability in a church that desperately needs it. So that's all I've got for you this morning. I'll turn it over to Pastor Nathan. Yeah, one of the things that was funny on when we were having lunch with JD is uh, he found out that uh, we were going to go to... Uh, Barcelona in Spain after the conference and we were excited to eat food and he like kind of stopped us and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Italy has the best food in the world. And I said, somebody say amen. I love that. Are you called to go to Italy? And um, yeah, I love that. And, and so I just said, okay, we'll make sure we tell our church that if they like food, go to Italy. Um, so anyway, it was incredible to meet him. I want to introduce you guys quickly to another Another man, uh, this guy is Pastor Karem Coach. Um, we have been supporting him. That's, look at Greg again. <laughs> I hope he's watching. If you are, hi, Greg. 
Um, <laughs> Pastor Karem, actually, uh, we've been supporting his church and ministry in Turkey for, I think, the, about the last seven years. Um, and he's planting in Turkey. Now, you guys know he's doing ministry in a very hostile environment. Uh, this is real life for him. This is not just watching the news. This is real daily life for him, the hostility toward the gospel. And as we sat down with him at lunch and he shared, just kind of gave us an update on his ministry and things, he, he through very sincere, heartfelt emotion, uh, wanted us to convey a sense of gratitude to you all for our faithful support of him and his ministry. Um, he told us that not only is he there pastoring and, and, and planting his church, um, he has about 50 people uh, in, in his church in Turkey. But he said because of Living Stone's support, he is able to not only do that, but also travel into other Middle Eastern countries in his area and actually train up church planters and missionaries and then send them back in to the Middle East to plant churches and to preach the gospel. And he straight up told us without Living Stones, he goes, I would not be able to do anything beyond my own church in Turkey. And so he wanted us to say thank you to all of you for being faithful. Um, it was evident he loves Jesus. He has such a heart for the gospel. He wants to see his city changed by the gospel. Um, you know, we asked him uh, just two more quick things. We asked him, man, it must be so cool, you know, to get up on a Sunday morning and open up the Bible and, and read that like some of the apostles traveled through your city like to read in the Bible that they were in your area. And we're like, that must be so cool. And he was like, well, it's not really. And we were like, oh, what do you mean? And he goes, well, he goes, it's heartbreaking to open up and read my city's name in the scripture and then realize how gospel broken it is. He was like, I'm up here preaching the gospel just like they did. And he's like, and people are anti-Jesus. And it was just, it was heartbreaking to hear this. Um, but he is, he is working hard, family. He is preaching Jesus. Um, he has the only gospel preaching church in his entire area. Those 40 believers there in Turkey. And so one last thing to share with you, he kind of made us laugh with it, but it really, it really showed the need for our continued prayer and support. Um, he said, hey, I want you guys to know something and I want you to rejoice with me. He said, uh, the apostle Paul, the apostle Peter, and even Santa Claus, he said, St. Nicholas, <laughs> all did gospel ministry in his area and in his country, but a lasting church was never planted. And he said, I want you guys to rejoice because 2,000 years later, and I want to rejoice, family, through our brother Karem, the gospel is being faithfully preached in Turkey. And so when you guys think about what's going on there, pray for Pastor Karem and pray for his church. Uh, it was an honor to support him. And then finally, uh, one more guy to introduce you to. Uh, this is uh, my friend, Pastor Alex. And uh, he pastors a church, and I, I got this right, I practiced, Aschaffenburg, Germany. And uh, one thing we learned when we showed up to the conference, and it was uh, interesting for our introverted wives, I think probably mostly mine, but as we were walking into the first session, we got an email with assigned seating. We couldn't sit together. And the point of the conference was to put us all at a different table each day so that we could meet 20 new people from all around the world. Uh, well, it was, it was cool because the first person I met was Pastor Alex. And uh, as I started talking with him, he was just sharing with me what's going on in Germany. He was sharing that he felt called to be a pastor uh, about 10 years ago, and he wanted to be a missionary, so he went to school to study, and he learned that his own hometown of Aschaffenburg, Germany, had a city of 260,000 people, has 0.2% Christians. And in his church of 45 people, he was like, I don't even know how much of that percentage is just our church. And he goes, so I realized very quickly, my own backyard is a mission field in dire need of the gospel. So he went back and he planted a church there. Um, he told me that God is moving. He said in the last two years of ministry, they were able by God's grace to baptize two people in the river out in front of their church. And when he shared that at the table, you guys, I don't want to get emotional yet. Everybody like erupted and they said, wow, that's a revival. God is saving people. This is unbelievable. And it was just, they were celebrating that God would awaken even one person. 
And so guys, I was just, I was moved with compassion for him. He shared lastly, they got a building, a 900 square foot building, which is a big, big deal. And uh, he said he's excited because by God's grace, soon they're gonna have one, um, I I messed this up at the nine o'clock, but one eight foot by eight foot room for their kids. And he is over the moon excited for this, to have a place for the kids in their church to go and learn about Jesus. And especially excited because I have the next photo here. Two weeks before he got to the conference, they had their first baby, uh, a little girl. And uh, yeah, so his, his own family is growing. And uh, he, just, he just has a heart for Christ. So all of that to say, guys, um, Garrett and I just wanted to share these because we want you guys to see beyond ourselves. Uh, we want you guys to know what God is doing around the world, and we want to encourage you to keep on supporting gospel work around the world. Know that every time you worship God financially at Living Stones, you personally are in large part supporting the gospel going out, not just here, but literally to these men and around the world. And so thank you. Thank you for looking beyond yourself. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being generous. To God be the glory, and may he be with these men and women as they labor for the gospel. I'll turn it over to Pastor Garrett for prayer. I hope these stories are a blessing to you. Uh, I hope that they're an encouragement so that you can hear that there is more going on than what we are doing here. Um, that the gospel is much bigger than Elko, Nevada. The gospel uh, affects the entire world. Um, and yeah, same thing. Thank you again for sending us. Thank you for supporting Living Stones Church and in turn, these church planters. Uh, the last thing that we want to do today is we want to pray for them. This is what they've asked for. They've asked for encouragement. They've asked for relationship and they have asked for prayer. And so we want to honor that. I hope that you'll remember these stories as you go out this week. I would encourage you to write them down if you take notes. Write down the names that you heard and the places that you heard about and pray for them continually because we are the church family. No one else is going to pray for us. We pray for us. Amen. All right, so if you guys wouldn't mind, I know these were just pictures on a screen, but if you feel comfortable, would you raise your hand? We're going to pray for these men uh, and their churches uh, right now. So if you guys would, just do one of these. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. God, it's incredible that you are saving people in a place that seems as dark as Europe. God, would you be with these men and their families as they strive to preach the good news to a dark place? God, would you allow your spirit to to move in, to set up camp, to bring light where there is darkness? God, would you use these church planners to do it? God, we lift up Karem and the 80 people who he meets with regularly. God, would you bless them? Would you encourage them? God, for Alex, would you just bless his church plan as it opens up? God, would people flock to hear the good news of the gospel? God, for JD, would you send them the help that they need? God, would you prepare ahead of time for that couple, that special couple who goes to build a new relationship and to be a part of something incredible? And God, would you change the spiritual climate of Italy? Would they be worshipers of the one true God and not worshipers of self? God, I pray for our church. God, I pray that we would never cease praying, encouraging, and supporting the gospel going out internationally. God, we need you to do a mighty work, and we thank you that we get to be a part of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome, guys. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we got to read God's word together, though. So if you would, grab your Bible, your device, grab one of those black Bibles that are around you on the seats, uh, and turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Uh, if you're using one of those black Bibles, you can uh, go to page 496. If you're using one of the Spanish translation Bibles, that's on page 888. And whenever you've found that, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. Again, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 27. Did you read along with me? It says, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you might gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, He taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live, get wisdom, get insight, do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth, do not forsake her and she will keep you, love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom 
and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteousness is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from now, I'm sorry, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Do not turn your foot or turn your foot away from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Would you guys pray with me? God, would you be with us today as we hear your word preached over us? God, would you open our hearts and minds to hear what you have for us? Give Pastor Nathan clarity. Give him boldness to preach your word. God, would you just be with us today as we hear about your wisdom? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. family. Hey, I don't even really say good morning to you yet. Good morning. I may or may not still be a little jet lagged. I am brutalized by the return journey home. Uh, 5 a.m. has never been so miserable in my life until I got home. I'm like, is it noon? Why am I awake? Uh, Anyway, hey, it's really good to be with you guys. Uh, I'm excited to be back here, uh, able to jump back into the book of Proverbs and continue in the sermon series we're in. Uh, that we're calling Learning to Thrive. And if you're new or visiting our church, here's what we're doing. Um, We're we're, we're engaging with this reality that uh, there's not a whole lot of people in the world, I've never met one, um, who want to fail at life, who want nothing they do to succeed. Like, I've never met somebody who wakes up and goes, "Mm, I hope today is riddled with failure. There's, there's a sense where we all want to succeed, we want to thrive, and so what we're doing is we're going to God's word and we're saying, okay, God, you are our creator, you are our maker, you are the one who gave us life, and in you is life and thriving and blessing. And so we're going to God's word to learn how to thrive. Now, today we're in Proverbs chapter 4, which is the middle of, of what we would call the intro to the book of Proverbs, which is the first nine chapters. And uh, as Solomon continues writing this letter to his son, uh, I want to kind of start by giving you guys the main point of my sermon this morning, or the big idea. And I'll put it on the screen for you if you're taking notes, but here's what I want us to hear. Don't just talk about wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Okay, don't just talk about wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Now, as Pastor Garrett read that proverb, if you were just kind of following through it quickly, it can almost seem like a repeat proverb. Uh, of earlier. And like I said, that's because we are still in the intro where Solomon is just 
unloading on his son the importance of wisdom. But it, it may seem like a repeat proverb too, because in a sense it kind of is, and here's why. Um, throughout the Proverbs, we see a lot of things repeated because it just kind of seems that no matter how many times we as human beings hear something, it doesn't stick, <laughs> right? We hear things and we forget or we choose not to obey, not to engage with it, hashtag parenting, right? We know, we know what's going on here. But if you paid attention in Proverbs 4, there's actually another direction Solomon is taking as he pleads with his son and us to embrace wisdom and live life not as fools, but as wise in the ways of God, okay? And what I want to do as I study the text is I want to kind of break this proverb down into three different sections. Again, if you're taking notes, I'll put them on the screen for you if you like this kind of stuff. Verse 1 through 9, uh, he's going to tell us to talk about wisdom. Verse 10 through 19, we're going to see that we can't just talk about wisdom. We need to walk in wisdom. And then in verse 20 through 27, I think there we find the fool's cure. The fool's cure, okay? So let's dive in, talk about wisdom. Look at verse 1 through 9. I want you to look in your Bibles and read it again with me as I follow along as I read. He says, Hear, O sons, a father's instructions, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. Sounds like parenting, right? Girls, listen to me. I'm not crazy. I'm telling you this stuff because it's good, because it leads to life. Hear what I'm saying, right? You following me? He says, when I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words and keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Speaking of wisdom, he writes, do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. So here in those verses, right, is a familiar call from Solomon to his son to embrace the wisdom that he's been telling him about. To not simply think wisdom is nice, but to actually desire it. A couple weeks ago, we saw Solomon tell his son to desire wisdom like kings desire treasure, right? As something valuable and, and wanted. But then as he talks, you'll notice something new that he says, which I think is critical to understanding this proverb. He begins to share with his son in verses one through four that this wisdom he's sharing is not something that originated with him. Did you notice that? He said, instead, it was something that began in his own relationships with his father and mother. Did you catch that? This is new. He lets us in here, church, on a beautiful reality that the wisdom that leads to life and thriving is not some new knowledge that's out there waiting to be discovered. It's not some new revelation that's out there like that we can try to achieve through some new extraordinary means. He's telling us here that the wisdom that leads to life and thriving is in fact the same as it's always been. It's the unchanging eternal truth of the one true God. Like you don't need to look anywhere else. You don't need to go anywhere else. It's not out there. It's never changed. He tells his son here, he begins to share that this knowledge of God, this wisdom was passed down to him from his parents. Who was his dad? King David. <laughs> He's like, this is a journey that I've been on. He's telling his son, like, in the wisdom I'm giving you is where hope and thriving in your life is found. So he's telling him to grab hold of it, to treasure it, to listen to his words. And, and as he's doing this, we know, don't we, that he is also hoping and praying like a good dad, that one day his son will share the same knowledge with his children, right? You can hear that. He wants it to keep going. You see, family, like this discipleship that we're engaging in, this pursuit of wisdom that we're all in, this desire for the knowledge of God that we all want is not to be something that ends with all of us. Did you know that? It's not to be something that ends when everyone in this room is gone. We are to be agents of multi-generational discipleship. Okay, it doesn't end with us. 
like here's here's why I bring this up. This I don't mean this to sound ranty, but I'm bothered by this. Okay. There's this new bend in our generation toward the complete opposite of this. There's this mantra that's like, let kids be free to pick their own beliefs. And I, and I see parents like, well, I just don't want to influence my kids. And I just, you know, sweetie, do whatever you want. And, you know, I just don't want to get in your way. And, and listen, it sounds well-meaning, right? It sounds well-meaning, but it looks like not discipling children in the knowledge of love for God when they're little because our culture is now saying it's oppressive. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I love you. I have to respond to foolishness like this. Are you kidding me? Like, let me help you. Let me help you with this. If you abdicate your role as lead disciple maker in your children's life, let me tell you where they're going to go. The scripture says they will choose evil always and continually. That's where they'll go. They will choose foolishness because apart from Christ, it's the only option. So can I, is that what you want? Like, that's my question. That's what you want. That's not what I want for my kids. That's not what I want for my girls. Know this, and I'll, I'll put this on the screen for you. We have to see, church, that walking the path of wisdom or folly in life is the difference between blessing and cursing in our homes and in our families. We have to understand this. The way we live matters. One commentator, Daniel Atkins, put it like this. He said that the chain of wickedness and sin in a family can be broken by one good and faithful generation who seeks after God. That's good news, right? That's really good news. Some of us, that's our story. But listen, the reason this call to generational discipleship is so critical is because the reverse is also true. That a chain of faithfulness to God in a family can also be broken by one generation who chooses to walk in foolishness and rejects the wisdom of God. See, family, one, one commentator said this, the goal of Christian parenting and discipleship is not just Christian children, but Christian grandchildren. That's the goal. Solomon tells his son that his father, King David, shared these words with him, and now he's passing on this truth to his son. And, and look, another reason this is so important uh, that he's saying this truth hasn't changed, son. It's the eternal truth. It's handed down through generations. It's nothing new. You don't need to hunt anywhere else but the scriptures. The reason it's so important is because many people today, uh, even some who once claimed to be Christians, have begun to search beyond the God of the Bible for wisdom and instruction. They've begun to look out in the world for things that will lead them to life and thriving. Some, some of us, maybe many of us in here are dabbling in this stuff, and I hope you're not, but many are searching the stars and horoscopes for wisdom and guidance rather than the one who made the stars, who knows their name. Many are searching for turning to, to, to drugs and experiences to open up their minds, thinking that new revelation is there only to learn that real life and thriving comes not through the opening up of one's mind to foolishness, but through the transformation of one's heart in the gospel. Okay? We're going to talk more about that in just a minute. But, but listen, heeding God's wisdom leads to a life of thriving and blessing. And as Solomon's telling his son, it pushes back the threat of destruction that foolishness always leads to. There will be no destination except destination destruction if you live life as a fool. There's no other option. See, family, we need to take a lesson from Solomon here and talk about the wisdom of God with our children. We must that they might hear and believe and grow in the knowledge and love for God. It's so critical. Let's not abdicate our role as lead disciple makers in our family. Okay, that's talk about wisdom. Verse 10 through 19, listen to what he says about walking in it. He says, hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. 
When you walk, your step will not be hampered. If you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it. Sound like parenting again? Don't do it. Stop. It's wrong. It's bad. Don't do it. I'm like, this is just a good dad. That's all it is. Avoid it. Don't go on it. Turn away from it. Pass on it. Verse 16. For they, evildoers, cannot sleep unless they've done wrong. And they are robbed of sleep unless they've made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Listen to this verse 18. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. We're going to come back to that. 19. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't even know over what they stumble. Look, I love this because this section of the Proverbs is amazing because we see Solomon move on with his son from just talking about wisdom, which is critical, to this idea and plea for his son to walk in wisdom. Like, I don't know if you caught this, but I underlined the word walk or word or path. I'm sorry, walk or way or path eight times just in those verses we just read. Like, those words are pointing us to something. They're they're inviting us to consider something about this life. What's it pointing us to? Well, this reality, that wisdom is not a status we arrive at in life through just obtaining knowledge or knowing a whole bunch of stuff about things. But actually, biblically speaking, wisdom is both a person to know and love and a path that we're to walk. It's both, okay? Okay. You can think of walking the path of wisdom as being similar to what the New Testament would call sanctification. We read about that in Galatians 5. It's this journey we're all on in life where we walk by the Spirit, in the fruits of the Spirit, and we're making decisions that are based on our desire to glorify and worship God with our whole lives, right? And then at the end, every day, we get to look a little more like Jesus by His grace, and then at the end, God finishes what He started in us. Like You can think of it like this. That is the walk that we're all on. And, and know this as you think about this walk of wisdom, this way of wisdom. Every decision that we make on this walk matters. In fact, every decision we make reveals something profound within us. Every decision we make in our lives as we walk whatever way we're walking reveals who it is that we're actually living for and who it is that we're seeking to glorify, who it is that we're trusting with our whole lives. Do you realize this, that every decision matters? Like the path we walk reveals whether or not we're following Christ or we're walking away from him. And our our daily decisions make the difference between stumbling and failing in life or thriving. We know this. How many of you are still paying for what you thought was a small, stupid decision in your life? I am. I'd imagine if we were honest, everyone's hands would go up. We may not have even realized how big that decision was. Every decision matters. Verse 12 teaches us that if we walk in the way of wisdom, we won't easily stumble or fall. We won't be tripped up by the world or the devil who's always seeking our destruction and our downfall. Like I read that, by the way, verse 12, and I thought, wouldn't that be nice? Like to be able to live your life and just go through life not living in crippling fear of making some life-altering mistake because of your own sin and foolishness. I'm like, that sounds amazing to me. Well, the question is, will we simply talk about wisdom? Or will we walk in it? Will will we put into practice what we learn? And I thought about that question for myself, and I realized, you know, the thing about fools, um, and I'll just say me, so you all don't get mad at me for calling you a fool. Uh, The thing about fools like you and me, I did it anyway, um, (laughs) is often we don't even realize when we're being foolish. Like, right? Right? Like so many times we don't even realize when we're being foolish. Like I'll, I'll switch to me now. I have made excuses in my life for, for things that have befell me 
And, and it's, foolishness sounds like this. When something happens in your life, it's always someone else's fault. It's never you. You never play a part in the downfall or hardship of your own life. It's always your wife or your boss or them or her or whatever it is, fill in the blank. It's called being a fool. We don't realize our own foolishness playing a part in this. Like maybe I know I've been there. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe some of us are there now. I think Solomon's giving us a wake-up call. I think he's saying, hey, what path are you on? You know, verse 18, I I want to come back to this verse. I love this. Verse 18 says that walking in the way of wisdom, he says, will be like the light of dawn that grows throughout the day, eventually lighting up the whole path. What he's saying here is that walking in the way of wisdom eventually gets easier and easier as we seek after God in all things and as we desire our choices in our lives to bring him glory. It it actually becomes easier. Like, let let me try to explain this. You know how living in, no, let me say not you know how. This is a fact. Living in constant foolishness actually rewires our brains to foolishness. This is a fact. Like foolishness creates neurological pathways in our brains that is when stimulated, stimulated by things, maybe a hard choice or pressure, we choose foolishness. It's literally an addiction. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing? Like, think of, here's how I know. A life of sin gets easier the longer you live in it, doesn't it? The longer you ignore the conviction you feel and you choose to live in sin, it gets easier and easier and easier to live like a fool. Eventually, we desensitize ourselves to it and it becomes our way of life. We addict ourselves to foolishness. But... Did you know that wisdom can also become a way in which we wire ourselves to live? It can. Like, the, like our bodies are amazing. You guys, God created us with such skill that the more that we discipline ourselves in something, the easier it becomes. Have you noticed that? Like the more that we strive to eat better food, the more natural it becomes. The more we actually desire good nutritious food. Like the more that we strive to work at Christian disciplines, basic Bible reading and prayer and all these things, the more easier it becomes. We actually crave it. We want to walk in the way of wisdom. You see, family, with faithful seeking after God's wisdom in life, we can actually reach a point where God is the first place we turn in life rather than a last resort. We can actually reach a place where prayer is the first place we go for solutions and power in life rather than the world or Google. The light of wisdom will grow, Solomon says, like the light of dawn as the sun rises higher and higher, and soon we will see all things in the light of wisdom. Walking the path of wisdom is is a lifestyle that avoids the foolish things that lead to death and destruction. And Solomon warns here that not just talking about wisdom, but walking in wisdom is critical. He's begging his son to pursue wisdom with discipline and make it a part of his life. And then you can just see, as I said, the heart of a dad. In verse 14 and 15, he's just telling him and us to avoid the path of the wicked. Don't do it. (laughs) Here's another way to think of this. When we come to crossroads in life, and we hit these often, don't we? When we come to crossroads in life and there's a decision that needs to be made and we see the path we want to take and it looks like the easier path, but we know somewhere deep down inside of us that it will lead us away from Christ and not towards him, Solomon says, this is is profound, don't take that path. This is the word of the Lord. Here it is. Don't do it. But so many times it happens, doesn't it? Like we're presented in life with a choice, the choice that our hearts desire, the one that seems right in our own eyes. We know in our spirit is the wrong one. What's the answer to this? Well, the answer, family, is the light of God's word and living in God's wisdom, which means living in relationship and desiring to glorify God's son. The answer is filtering every decision in your life through the lens of, will this bring honor and glory to my God or will it not? 
Sometimes we need help. Well, here's three things you can do if you're stuck on a decision. Number one, you can go straight to God. You can ask God your Father through Jesus Christ, His Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom for the decision that's ahead of you. And the scripture says God loves to give wisdom to his kids who ask him. He loves it. Here's another thing you can do. Open up your Bible. Open up your Bible. Look for wisdom here. Here's another thing you can do. Take your decision to your community of faith in your life. Tell them what's going on. Invite them to pray with you and seek wisdom together that you might make the right decision. Even though I think we know in our heads it's true, some of us are still struggling to realize there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. You were not created by God to do life alone. You weren't even saved just you. The Bible says God has saved his people and he has called us to live not as his individuals, but his people, the sheep of his pasture, implying we're all together. I know that our culture today says, just do you, bro. Just you. It's foolishness, guys. It's foolishness. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ affects the whole of your life, and it will guard you from foolishness and foolish decisions that lead to destruction. Uh, You know, Pastor Eric uh, did a great job last week of talking about this. That was his very first sermon here, and I was like, bro, Jesus was lifted high. He did a phenomenal job talking about this. But Solomon is calling us to live in the light of wisdom so as not to make the mistake of foolishness that comes from staying in the dark. Do you guys know darkness leads to foolishness? Here's a story. When I was working out at Nevada Gold Mines, I would regularly, like many of you, uh, get ready for the day's work in the dark, you know, so I don't wake up my family, try, try to like be honoring to the family who's still sleeping. But no matter how I prepared the night before, no matter how prepared I thought I was, I would often regularly make some kind of a mistake that would affect my entire day. I'd wear the wrong shoes, I'd I'd do something crazy. One day as I was getting ready, I was getting my lunch and stuff ready, I opened up the cabinet in my dark kitchen uh, where the vitamins were and without knowing it, I took a full spectrum of women's vitamins and supplements. (laughs) Now, Physically, I was okay, but mentally, that messed me up all day. I was having like psychological stuff. I was like, I'm emotional. I don't understand. And my wife's like, you're fine. It's a multivitamin, but it messed me up in my head. Can't believe I shared that publicly. That's okay. Um, What did I learn? I learned to slow down, make better choices, and this will be a shocker, even consider turning on a small light. Why? Because darkness leads to foolishness. What am I thinking I can control and see in the dark? This is what Solomon's saying. Shine the light of God's wisdom on everything. Make decisions in the light of the wisdom of God. So I think, I think we kind of like, we have to like ask ourselves here, what area of your life are you trying to navigate in the darkness of your own will? in the darkness of your own desire, what you want for you, what decision are you trying to avoid the light of Christ in? And why do you think that avoiding the light of Christ in your decision-making will lead you anywhere besides destruction? We're not listening. Solomon's telling his son, don't just talk about wisdom. Walk in it, do it, practice it. What decisions do you have in front of you that you need to take to the word of God, to the spirit of God, and to the people of God and ask for guidance? I'd really encourage you to do that. You see, in John chapter 20, I love this, Jesus actually said that he alone is the way. I love this. He says he's the way, the truth, and the life, right? But he says he's the way. We are to walk in Jesus, because that is walking in the wisdom of God. Did you know in early church history, when Christians would travel and churches were still kind of underground and things like that, 
Um, we always hear the story about the fish, the ichthus that they would draw on the ground to kind of identify safely who were Christians. Did you know the question they often asked in the beginning? They wouldn't say, do you follow Jesus Christ? They would, say, they would meet people and they would say, hey, um, are you people following the way? And that meant, are you a Christian? You see this? There's a way to walk, a way to live, and it's the way of wisdom. It's the way of Christ. To, to live not in and through Christ is to live as a fool. It's to live foolishly. It's choosing to do your own things rather than through the wisdom of God. And like, I need us all to hear something as we practically look at our life. We look at these decisions. We look at the way we're walking. Hear this. Unchecked or ignored foolishness in any area of our lives, no matter how small it may seem, unchecked or ignored foolishness is actually revealing something greater within you than you might think. It's actually revealing that you're moving away from Christ, that there's a part of your life you have not submitted to Christ. It's actually revealing that somewhere you have a problem with Jesus. Th this is what this reveals. When we, uh, we have unchecked or ignored or, or whatever, foolishness and sin that we will not engage with, it's revealing somewhere in your life you have a problem with Jesus. You haven't surrendered it to him. Foolishness is always an indicator of our proximity to Christ and whether or not we're walking in wisdom or just talking about it. Because walking in wisdom, family, will affect all aspects of our lives and not just certain parts, not just the parts we want it to affect. You see, when we choose to walk in the wisdom of God, living stones, we are surrendering the whole of our lives to God all of our lives. Here, here's what happens though. It's too often we think that wisdom is like sprinkles that we put on top of the ice cream sundae of our own lives. That's not what we're called to do. That's not how we're to engage with the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is to be our lives. It, it's not a topping we take or leave. A Christ-controlled, wisdom-filled life looks like a life where all areas and all decisions we make, we do so with the desire to glorify Christ. All areas. And, but here's the thing. Sometimes we think we're doing pretty good, you know? Like, we think that we're just sprinkling wisdom and we're all right. Like, you need to hear that you can be killing it in a whole bunch of areas of your life, but if there are still some areas not surrendered to Christ, you're not killing it. It's actually affecting you. If there are some areas in your life not surrendered to Christ, it's revealing by God's grace. If right now you're thinking of something, this is God's grace. It's revealing that somewhere in your heart, you have a problem with Jesus and you need to address it because if you let it go, it's gonna lead to foolishness and destruction. It, it's not about killing it 80%. It's about living fully surrendered to Christ. One pastor said it like this. You can have amazing quiet time in your life. You can be a master of silence and solitude, but if you can't control your tongue, it reveals you have a problem with Jesus. You can raise your hands high during worship, but if you can't clean your room when your mom tells you to, you've got a problem with Jesus. You can be in three different Bible studies all week long, but if you go home and nag your husband constantly, you've got a problem with Jesus. Men, you can teach a Bible study class every week, but if you can't take the trash out for your wife, it reveals somewhere in your heart you got a problem with Jesus. See, these things reveal, family, they reveal that we've gotten off the path of wisdom, or as verse 13 says, we're not holding on to wisdom. We're not holding on to Christ. Where in your life are you holding on or fighting for control rather than trusting and submitting to Christ. Now look, we, what we just talked about matters immensely because now we're sort of all faced with the question like, where do I go? <laughs> like, what's the way forward? I, I think many of us may think, if there's some humility here, many of us may think like, man, like I can see the foolishness in me. Like I see myself in Solomon's letter to his son. I am his son, <laughs> I can see this in me. And, and maybe some of us are thinking, man, like I just really need to get a grip, you know? 
I need to just man up. I need to like make decisions and pull myself up by my bootstraps and do more and try harder and handle mine. That's what I'm going to do. And you're like sort of pumped. <laughs> Look, here, I, I, I couldn't even finish it without laughing because that was like my story. I would go to a Christian camp or something and I'd be like, man, this is the day where I put my foot down against my sin. It get, made it like 20 minutes. Actually, I didn't make it any because that's pride, sinner, you know. But here's, here's the thing we got to hear as we laugh about it. The reason I wanted to make us laugh is because what I just described is foolishness. It's foolishness. With all the effort and striving and power you could muster, the best you will be able to do against your sin and foolishness is put up some guardrails to help you out for a little while. It's like bowling. When you just suck, like, you, you know, you have like your kid go ask the lady at the front counter to put the guards up, but it's really for you. That, that's what trying to fight sin and foolishness and your own powers like. It'll just, it'll just bump the guardrails for a while, but eventually they're coming down and you're going to be exposed for the fool you are. It, it's like you won't be able to solve the problem of foolishness and sin with your effort alone. Think of a, a foolishness and sin like a weed. Think of something that many of us are dealing with, dandelions right now. You look at your yard and you know, you see those little yellow flowers, you know that if you don't handle that, it's going to spread and soon it's going to overtake your yard. So, so imagine that you decide, you know what, you're going to solve it. You're going to handle your business and you're going to mow your yard faithfully, constantly. As soon as you see that yellow flower, you're dragging out the mower, you're going to do it. Because you know, if you wait too long, that thing's going to turn white and it's like, right? It's game over. So you're like, I'm going to handle it, okay? And you're mowing faithfully for a while. Eventually, you're mowing every day, and you're like, what is happening? But then one day, something happens. Life happens. You forget. You slack off. You forgot to buy gas. Your mower breaks down. I don't know. One day, you just decided to sleep in. You forgot about it. Next day, you decide to go out there and mow, and you don't even realize it, but there are like triple the amount of yellow flowers, and some of them are already white in your yard. You're like, how did this happen so quickly? All you did with your effort, right, was delay the inevitable. What's the only way to solve a dandelion problem? Kill the root, right? What's the only way to solve a foolishness problem? Kill the root. You, you, gotta, you gotta get to the root. We can't ignore even the smallest weed. Here's what I want you to hear. We can't try our way to wisdom. We have to trust our way to wisdom. Okay? L listen, guys, especially, this is a conversation I have with you guys often in different things, but all of us hear this. You don't need a better battle plan against sin in your life. What you need is a new heart that's captivated by Christ. I'm going to say it again. Men, you don't need a new battle plan or a Christian book with a sword on the front of it to be able to battle your sin. You don't need a stronger battle plan. You need a heart that's captivated by Jesus. Proverbs continually teaches us that wisdom is a person to love and a path to walk. Solomon begs his son to walk the path of wisdom because he knows, but he knows, that unless his son's heart is made new, he couldn't even if he wanted to. That's why finally, family, Proverbs 4.23 is one of the most important verses in the whole book of Proverbs, and honestly, for the whole of our lives, because in it, we see the cure for foolishness. Look at verse 23. He says, son, keep or guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. See, family, the problem with our lives is our heart. The source of foolishness in our lives is our hearts. And the worst thing to trust to lead you or guide you in your life is your heart. Like, I know we love the t-shirt, follow your heart. That is the worst thing you could do. The prophet Jeremiah wrote, what well, we've heard this, that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Solomon says, unless we keep our hearts, guard them with all vigilance and watch them, we will all go astray in devastating ways. But aren't our hearts deceitful? We're like, all right, I'm going to guard my heart. And then what happens? We fall into the trap of the Pharisees, don't we? 
so quick. We don't even realize we're doing it. We fall into the trap of thinking that behavior modification is the solution to our foolishness and sin. Don't we? Like we were like, man, if I can just get it together and look good on the outside and have my stuff together, then everything's okay. Behavior modification isn't the answer, family. Remember, even if you mow the lawn constantly, those weeds keep spreading and showing up again and again and again. Making your yard look freshly mowed doesn't mean it ain't full of weeds, does it? That's what behavior modification does. You're like, I'm gonna look good and, and act as if your heart is black. We have to address the root, the heart. Our hearts are the command centers for our lives. From them flow foolishness or wisdom. So the answer, family, is not try harder, but trust deeper. The answer is to figure out where in our lives we don't believe Jesus is better than our sin or foolishness and address it at the root. Listen, there's a root cause for your marriage problems. There's a root cause for your porn addiction. There's a root cause for your anger problem. There's a root cause of your depression and despair and anxiety. There is a reason, and this is so rampant right now, there is a reason that you love distracting yourself with all the problems of the world and the sins of others rather than looking in at your own messed up heart. There's a reason. The list could keep on going. Listen, you need to find out why you love. Let me rephrase that. You need to find out why you don't trust Jesus in these areas. And then ask the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to surrender the whole of you to Christ, because that's the key. Not behavior modification, deeper trust in Christ, who is the wisdom of God and the giver of new hearts that we so desperately need. The whole rest of the chapter, Solomon pleading with his son, don't get distracted, don't get off course, stay the path of wisdom. And look, family, God loves us so much. He loves us so much that rather than let us die in our foolishness, and in the deceit of our own hearts, he sent his son Jesus to rescue us. This is the story of the Bible. That's what we're all here for. Because we all struggle, right? We all do. We all have sinful hearts that beckon us to foolishness. But God, by his spirit, is inviting us to life and thriving as we turn to his son, the Lord Jesus, and we walk in his ways. We all need to trust Christ today. Christians, you need to trust Christ again. You need to see that he's more beautiful than your sin. You need to relinquish control. You think you can handle your life better than Jesus. You're playing a fool. Many of us need to trust Christ for the first time. You need a new heart to walk in wisdom and be able to know you're on the right path in life. You need to see Jesus and rejoice with us that he lived the perfect life we could never live. He lived that for us. You need to be able to rejoice as, oh man, I do, that Jesus was wise for all the times I'm a fool. That he walked the path of righteousness for all the times I chose stupidity. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin, which is death. And then he rose again, showing that he has power over sin and death, that it's broken. And when we turn to him, we have life everlasting. Family, Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God and he has come to rescue us. He is the way and the truth and the life and nobody comes to the Father and nobody finds wisdom except through him. So may we not simply talk about wisdom, but may we walk in wisdom. May we guard our hearts, the command center of our lives and keep focused on Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen? Let's pray. God, we love you. We're thankful for who you are and what you've done. Thank you for, for your word. You didn't have to speak to us, and yet you did, so thank you. God, thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, who is our righteousness, who is our salvation, without whom we would die in our foolishness. So God, make us wise as we walk in the way, which is your son. We love you. May our lives bring glory and honor to you, and may our lives show an unbelieving world the beauty of our Lord and Savior. We love you. Do this in us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So each week after we hear a sermon preached, we respond in a time of confession. This is an opportunity for each one of us who have just heard the gospel proclaimed, who have heard wisdom from God's word preached over us to confess of anything that we may need to confess of. And today, uh, what I'd like to lead us in is this. I think we heard a call from Solomon in Proverbs to not just simply talk about wisdom, 
uh, but to, to walk in it. And this is so difficult for each one of us because ultimately it requires full surrender of our will to God's. It requires us to actually trust him. And so today, during our time of confession, what I'd like you to do in silence is confess your sin of trusting in yourself instead of trusting and submitting to the will of God. So let's take about 30 seconds now and let's do that. The good news that we have today uh, is this. Even in our foolishness, the gospel says that God is gracious and he is merciful and that when we confess to him, he forgives us. That's good news. Amen. So this morning, we're going to celebrate that good news by celebrating communion together. Now, communion is the meal that we take together as Christians to celebrate God's goodness to us. Uh, through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We remember Jesus' blood shed through the wine or the juice, and we remember his body broken through the bread that we take. Uh, And so this morning, we're going to do that. We're going to do that every single week because God says to do that until literally, until Jesus comes back and takes us home. This is our weekly reminder of the goodness and the grace of God. So we're going to take it together. If you're not a Christian uh, and you're just kind of exploring what all this looks like today, I'd recommend that you let these plates pass you. Uh, Our goal isn't to exclude you or leave you out. It just doesn't make sense for you to participate in this when it's not something that you believe. The people around you are actually in agreement together taking these elements saying, we believe that Jesus has saved us. If you're not ready to proclaim that, just let those plates pass. No one is going to judge you. No one is going to think less of you. But for those of us who are going to take this meal together today, let us rejoice that our God has come for us. Let us rejoice that in his sovereign grace and his wisdom, he sent Jesus for us. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this reminder God, we commit to you to take it week after week, every time we gather, remembering your goodness and your grace to us. God, would you meet us today in a powerful way as we celebrate together? Uh, God, I'm asking that you would bless this meal and bless our time together as we take it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take communion together. From dust we've come, and dust we are, and shall return. Be still, my soul, and let it go, just let it go.
In a few moments, we're going to take uh, an offering um, to honor God and to worship God with our finances. But before we do that, uh, I just kind of wanted to share something with you. Uh, if you've ever heard me preach before, um, I think you might know that I'm, I'm kind of a fan of movies. Uh, I love using films uh, as illustrations because I'm lazy and I don't have to come up with them and myself. Some other great director uh, already did that. But have you ever hung out till the end of the movies? Um, if you're a Marvel fan, you've definitely hung out till the end of the movie, right? You got to wait till all those credits roll so that you can see the awesome film at the end that tells you what the next movie is going to be about. And you can get all excited and geek out about it and go Google it afterwards. But, but here's the deal. When you're sitting there at the end of the movie and those credits are rolling, those are hundreds, possibly thousands of names of people who played an integral part in making sure that that film came to production. Have you ever thought about that? They didn't stick those up there because they were bored and needed to give you time to get out of the theater. Those are there because they want to honor those who have done work to make sure that this thing all comes together. Now, as a church, we're kind of like that, too. There are so many people involved in what goes on, not just on a Sunday morning, but in caring for God's people throughout the week, uh, in doing the work of the ministry here in Elko, in northern Nevada, throughout the entire world. The church is just like that. There are too many names, there are too many people to even be able to recognize who are integral in making sure that all of this happens. There are people in the next room who you haven't even seen who are loving and caring for children and preaching the gospel to them. There are safety team members out in the hallway right now that are making sure that nothing weird happens here. They're out there to keep us safe and to make sure that everything goes well. There are people who just handed out your communion and all of this. My point is, there are so many of you who make this thing happen. And in your financial offering, the same is true. That, that over the years, the only reason why the gospel has been able to go out and affect Elko in the way that it has is because of your faithful and consistent generosity. I just want you to consider that as you give today. Now, we can't roll the credits. That's, unfortunately, that's just not something that we're able to do. But I want you to remember uh, that, that as you worship God, you're not just a name on a screen, though. You're not just scrolling by. You're actively participating in what he is doing in our city and beyond. So as we give today, let's keep that in mind, that God is using our generosity to change lives, to affect eternity. That's incredible. So I'm going to pray over our offering, uh, and as you prepare, you can write a check, you can give with cash, that'll go in the baskets that are passed around, uh, and if you are... Uh, Prefer digital methods, you can use those. Those are on the screen behind me. We've got an app and a website, places where, where you can put a card in and give. Um, but our goal today is to be a part of what God is doing by worshiping him with our finances. Let's pray. Let's receive our offering. God, we thank you for this opportunity to participate in your mission. God, I, I personally thank you for those who are faithful and generous to living stones and faithful and generous to those around them. God, that's a sign of people who love you. So God, would you continue to bless those who give? God, would you continue to bring joy to our church through this act of worship? God, and would you bless this offering today? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's receive our offering.
All right, we're going to go ahead and continue in our musical worship portion. Uh, as we heard beautifully from uh, Pastor Nathan, uh, when we follow our own desires and follow our own flesh, uh, it only leads us in one place, foolishness and sin. That's why uh, Romans tells us that our sin resides in our flesh. Uh, so because of that, because of our fall of nature, we are not worthy of salvation. It's just the truth. We can't get around that. So we have to find our salvation somewhere else. And we find it in Jesus, Jesus Christ, because he was able to live that perfect life, because he was uh, able to do what he did through his life, death, and resurrection, we can have our salvation. So the next song, is he worthy? That is the question. Yes, he is. But as we sing this song, I want us to remember that he is worthy, but because of our fallen nature, we are not. So let's keep that in mind. If you would stand with us, uh, we'll go ahead and continue.
church. 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 So as many of you guys know, Pastor Seth is out this summer on sabbatical, uh, much needed and much welcomed. Uh, but would you guys do me a favor? The people who were up here this morning leading you in worship have very rarely been led without him here, and they are killing it. Would you give them another hand? Thank you guys very much. Um, I mean, 
Our services are about the worship of God, but we need to give honor where it's due. Uh, and these guys have been killing it all week, getting ready to lead us. So thank them if you get an opportunity. Uh, now, we never want to come in here, worship, and hear God's word without having something to take away. And that's this. Guys, this week, as you go out, may you go out walking in wisdom so that as you live outward, as you preach the gospel, as you are kind, loving to your neighbors, as you let them know the good news that God loves them, they can see that in the way that you walk. Amen? And in benediction, which is a fancy word for ascending prayer, may God's wisdom, which he gives freely, go with you this week, and may it bring you back here safely to worship him again. Go in peace. You guys are dismissed. Wow. Have a wonderful afternoon. It was great to worship with you guys. Take it easy. Have a great week. You're dismissed. Sorry about that.